Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our session in association with Mahindra Insurance Brokers Limited. Uh, before we get started, uh, I would just like to very quickly get an audio check from the audience. Uh, could you just verify if the voice is loud and clear? Okay, good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, you know, it's been done to dust it, but the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has disrupted global trade. Today's topic, uh, we will talk a lot about trade. And hence, I thought of beginning with, uh, with this uh, with this statement, which you've probably heard before, uh, uh, that the disruption has happened. And consequently, uh, trade finance is also something which has uh, taken a back seat. Now, you know, governments were obviously forced to uh, uh, impose abrupt lockdowns. Uh, resulting in a sudden global economic standstill and a significant drop in uh, GDP, not only in India, but globally. Now, the worldwide markets uh, saw considerable economic effects uh, because of prolonged shutdowns and border closures. But after two long years of fighting the pandemic, the credit rating agencies reported fewer downgrades and observed a marginal improved credit quality. But then the Russia-Ukraine conflict has caused uh, a lot of turbulence and you know, we are back to where we started from. Uh, the supply chains are also equally disrupted. Now, understanding the variables and complexities of international trade is critical uh, in managing risks associated. And as you know, losses keep growing in magnitude, uh, the uncertainties are not reducing, the economy is currently still not back to where people would have wanted. Uh, and all this has remained very consistent with us. But as losses keep growing, uh, the challenges have become more and more imperative. Now, account receivables or AR constitute more than 40%, and this is quote unquote from a recent report, but constitute more than 40% of the company's assets. But on average, one in 10 invoices is becoming delinquent. And trade credit insurance is, is probably your go-to measure which can help in recovering bad debts owing to bankruptcies of the buyer. So it is an important, important topic today. A great, uh, credit insurance is suitable for, contrary to popular belief, suitable to all types of businesses, whether they are trading nationally or internationally, and for a variety of sectors from manufacturing to services. Uh, even in terms of size, the benefits can apply to micro S. SMEs uh, right through to the largest multinationals. As always, we have a very eminent panel of speakers uh, who will uh, you know, discuss this more at length, but I just very quickly wanted to thank Mahindra Insurance Pro Brokers Limited as one of the companies who's come forward to talk about this pressing topic. Uh, Mahindra Insurance Brokers Limited are committed to providing value to their customers by understanding their insurance needs and risk profile. Uh, the company provides just a little bit of background so that you know we are in sync. The company provides direct insurance broking for corporate and retail customers and offers a range of products for the non-life and life segments. In addition, Mahindra Insurance Brokers Limited also offers value-added services like, like risk management, audit, which includes risk inspection and gap analysis, portfolio management which also includes claim handling. So today's topic is building resilience through credit insurance and I would like to welcome uh, Baishaki Shah, a very senior practice leader uh, looking after liability and specialty lines with Mahindra Insurance Brokers Limited. Uh, Baishaki, welcome. Hello, am I? Yes, Vishakhi, now I can hear you. You're audible. Shantanu, am I audible? Okay, okay. Thank you, Shantanu. 
good afternoon good afternoon everybody thank you for joining the session shantanu gave some good insight on why trade credit insurance is gaining popularity so i will again uh, set the stage now we at mahindra insurance brokers we believe in endeavoring uh, you know to provide the best of the advices to our corporate clients uh, to ring fence their businesses against any insurable eventuality in the best possible manner and we also offer bespoke solutions that revolve around unique business needs of each and every corporate because uh, insurance and especially the specialized insurance policies like trade credit policies or liability policies are such insurance policies where you know you cannot have one size fit for all it has to be a customized tailor made solution for each and every corporate even if they are in the same set of business or even if they are peer uh, you know they are competitors to each other so our experts with both local understanding and knowledge of international regulations are well trained in handling insurances or risk in geographies of the world and ensure that businesses are compliant with the local regulations in respective geographies so today we have uh, gathered here to discuss about the importance of having trade credit insurance policy in place and how it helps us building resilience in today's vulnerable or volatile situation or world we are in so obviously pandemic is something which is the most talked about subject today and it has had devastating effect on economies and soci societies across the world especially on international trade and supply chain covid-19 can be constru construed as black swan event that has forced many companies across the globe to rethink and transform their supply chain model not only that supply chain disruptions are also significant and widespread across the globe so if you look around there are a lot of small time companies who did not have proper cash flow arrangements they have gone through bad times and also that some of them they were heavily re relying on their sellers to make good the dues to them but unfortunately because of stringent lockdown and because of uh, covid uh, situation in various part of the globe businesses have suffered massively and the supply chain in, uh, disruptions have initiated or made companies think differently they have started using digital supply networks they have also updated some some of them have updated inventory policies and focused on cash flow which was not very much talked about because up till the covid 19 that is 2019 2020 the organizations were very uh, you know very much reliant on the cash flow arrangements that they have traditionally for years together because they knew their buyers they knew the sellers they they had that supply chain uh, arrangements in place which were typically there for number of years but covid 19 disruption has really affected all of them in one single supply chain and because of which the companies are compelled to look around for some of the other payment policies maybe methodology like you know they might have to rethink their supply chain model they might have to to rethink about their uh, pre payments or payments which are their cash discounts which are there even exporters are facing the heat why because exporters are also facing that short term financing is becoming difficult in today's scenario and this problems are faced by exporters and supply chain both now export credit uh, credit agencies are boosting their working capital support programs and which is trying to uh, you know cut, curtail this issues faced by exporters but as the crisis triggered by pandemic continues pressure on buyers also increasing increases the crisis has led buyers to uh, you know look at the kind of revenues which they are making basically or in certain sectors which have been hit severely companies need to have disaster recovery plan business sustainability business continuity policies in place and they are also required to able to generate profits in order to develop now covid 19 has also led to recession for some of the countries and businesses small businesses are particularly vulnerable to bankruptcies as they are unable to withstand a drop in sale amid mounting economic certain uncertainty large companies are not immune if it's a listed entity the kind of cash flow issues or disruptions in their supply chain arrangement or cash flow will definitely have impact on their share prices which will again lead to a corporate 
corporate governance related issue because it may bloat companies accounts receivable receivable and liquidity issues can impact consumers and supply chain now customers who owe money may be slow to make payment or fail to make payment altogether the company may in turn be forced to slow down its own payment cycle and there are a, a, a certain companies like manufacturing companies they are for, they may be forced to close down certain manufacturing plants or discontinue with their poorly performing plants a level of uncertainties that have increased drastically which has been again fueled by russia ukraine conflict and inflations in some of the countries like us and europe it it is only adding to the woes of certain manufacturers or businesses which are heavily relying on such trade financing now how trade credit insurance policy can come to rescue or can be used as a risk management or risk mitigation tool because it covers the payment risk resulting from the delivery of goods or services on open credit terms trade credit insurance provides cover for businesses if customers who owe money for products or services do not pay their debts or pay them later than the payment term dictated it gives businesses the confidence to extend ex uh, credit to new customers and improve access to funding many banks and financial institutions are also now looking at purchasing this cover directly from the insurance company to support their lending activities and protect against losses alternatively banks will also take assignment to existing policies held by certain insurance insured organizations so when classic case is uh, dating back to 2010 where oriental insurance company was the insurance company that company was settled with a claim of 400 crore from five respective banks including state bank of india bank of india indian bank andhra bank and idbi bank so what was the issue on hand paramount airline had taken a credit insurance cover from oriental insurance company in 2008 9 for its multiple bank guarantees to cover its transactions with state owned oil companies now for some reason this airline chennai based airline could not repay the loan and defaulted on bank guarantees issued by these five banks and oriental insurance company on other hand had not taken any reinsurance cover to support this particular transaction and disturbed by this movement or disturbed by this issue irda insurance regulatory development authority of india had banned complete sale of credit insurance by general insurance companies only one state owned export credit guarantee corporation that is ecgc was allowed to do such policies or issue such issue such policies so how this you know credit insurance comes to the rescue of some of the companies now ultimately credit insurance is widely accepted as an effective risk management tool by banks and also it will uh, enable the bank to fund more liberally so if an organization is able to produce credit insurance policy to a bank bank at least knows that you know there is a, a recourse when the company which is taking loan it defaults in making good the uh, loan right so however letter of credit is something which is you know very much accepted world over but this letter of credit also can be inflexible and expensive at times and in this covid situation many companies are increasingly coming under pressure from their customers to move from the secure terms of payment to open account terms and being able to offer open account credit terms is often seen as a competitive advantage and a real differentiator in a challenging trading environment so this insurance policy enhances an insured to move from such secure terms to open account with confidence that they are ultimately protected in the event of buyer being defaulting so which are the major coverages under this policy so typically this policies come with three major covers one is protracted default or delay in payment the other one is insolvency of buyer third one is political risk like war or import export embargo natural disaster to name a few these are the basic covers so how this policy typically functions 
traditionally the insurance companies and reinsurance companies offering this cover believed in covering whole turnover policy so what do we mean by whole turnover so there can be an uh, an organization where they have domestic and export turnover now organizations having domestic turnover would be very comfortable with the buyers they have in domestic markets for but obvious reasons that they have you know in person touch in person connect with those buyers but some of the companies may have issues in having this uh, you know export turnover and they would only wish to cover export turnover so traditionally apart from ecgc none of the insurance companies in india were able to offer this you know pick and choose kind of scenario now the market has evolved companies have opened up the reinsurance companies have also come forward this is predominantly when it comes to indian market it is predominantly reinsurance driven product so now uh, since the product has evolved and insurance company are more flexible to offer tailor made policy coverage so some of the different type of options which are available are selected portfolio or a specific sector or a product line which can be covered or a specific country turnover can be covered so if uh, an organization wishes to cover only domestic turnover against this credit open credit terms that is possible or some of the products which are uh, you know vulnerable or which are uh, going most of this product lines are going for open uh, credit terms they can be covered or bank funded buyers so these are some of the options which are available for organizations now which was not available earlier years and benefits what are the benefits of having trade credit insurance policy so it protects businesses from accounts receivables not only that it also expands or gives an opportunity to the insured organization to expand their sales from existing customers to any new customer without any uh, having increase in risk in their balance sheet so it is kind of a protection to the balance sheet liability as well it also helps protect against potential restatement of earnings and it optimizes bank financing by ensuring trade receivables and also insurance companies also have a mechanism to keep an eye on all the buyers which are declared under the policy so the insurance company will also raise a red flag if they see a buyer you know not paying money in time or the behavior of the buyer in across the industry or in a particular segment immediately the insurance company will raise a flag and the uh, seller that is the insured organization will able to take a stand whether they wish to continue trading with that particular buyer or not so it is very important tool even for the board men board members and from the corporate governance point of view also now how, the, how these policies are priced you know these policies are priced by applying a premium rate on whole turnover or the kind of turnover which is disclosed and at the end of the policy period there will be a reconciliation which will be done by the insurance company basis the actual turnover which is covered under the policy now there are certain obligations of insured organization also they also need to ensure that credit limits are applied for each of the buyers correctly if there is no credit limit applied by the insurance company the the insured organization is allowed to put a discretionary credit limit for each of the buyers so that they also know that up to what limit their exposure is uh, you know open and up to what limit the insurance company will make good the loss now they also need to organizations also need to report any delay in payments or overdue in payments or if they and uh, they come to know from the market that a particular buyer is on the verge of bankruptcy or they are not able to withstand the pressure of pandemic or the kind of business they are into then they need to immediately inform the insurance company and they also need to have in internal mechanism to you know make such note uh, to bring such uh, you know examples or bring such case studies to the table and take appropriate approval from the board whether to continue with this business or not right so uh, which are the insurance companies in india who offer this cover so there are very few namely tata ig hdfc ergo new india sbi general ifco tokyo to name a few and new india as well and 
दिस इंश्योरेंस कंपनीज आर बैक बाय री इंश्योरेंस कंपनीज लाइक कोफास और यूलर हम्स अट्रेडियस चार्टिस क्यूबी एट्सेट्रा राइट सो नाउ अगेन what will company do if they do not have a credit insurance and what will company benefit if they have a credit insurance policy so monitoring of credit limits it is solely the responsibility and the job of the company if they do not have this credit insurance trade credit insurance whereas if they have it the insurance company also is equally responsible to monitor the credit limits and the kind of exposure they have for each of the buyers now credit underwriting the company will have to decide basis their you know limited market knowledge or limited experience there is you know credit limit to be designed or whether the buyer should be accepted as a buyer on open credit terms again the insurance company will have a mechanism historically they will be able to collect the data and you know give inputs to the insured organization for a particular set of buyers or for particular set of countries where you know you have more concentration for your trade so uh, this is about the trade credit policy what we uh, were to were here to discuss about now we will move on to panel discussion where we will have you know some of the esteemed speakers with us who will give us idea about uh, you know give us insight on various kind of exposures which a company may face because of uh, businesses which are being done on credit credits thank you veshakshi uh, ladies and gentlemen please remain locked in veshakshi and i with the rest of the speakers will join you in under 60 seconds thank you very much for staying uh, online and uh, we are back with our next panel uh, we will talk about navigating the barriers of credit risk the session will be moderated by uh, veshaki sha uh, and uh, i'm just going to quickly introduce our speakers i've got rajneesh sir uh, he's the former cfo of uh, bomber india I've got uh, Rahul, who's the CFO and full-time director with Roche. I've got Yogesh Mittal, who's the global finance leader with Rio Tinto, and I've got uh, Jagdish, who's the CFO of Delphin Gen India. Uh, Veshaki, in the interest of time, I would request you to begin the session. And to all the delegates, if you have questions, please post them online. I'd be happy to ask the speakers once they're done. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. so i will just immediately start uh, the panel discussion so my first question is to mr yogesh mittal uh, how are governance bodies like boards and audit committees reacting to enhanced risk in customer dealings and recoverability space what are their expectations from direct and directions to the ceo and cfo of the organization for uh, shakti thanks for the question and team thank you so much for having me on the discussion uh, let's uh, let's look at uh, you know the space that we're talking about you know trade credit is a very powerful commercial tool for conquering new markets building customer loyalty you know however if you really look at the underlying risk it's like a double edged sword where uh, you know uh, while it carries a lot of business advantage also brings in a lot of risk you know that uh, a business has to be very conscious of uh, today's uh, environment if you look at it you know the challenges what are the challenges the companies are facing at the enterprise level you know the constant shifting headlines around trade conflicts political strife social unrest you know pandemic cyber attack there's so much that is happening however companies that focus on operational excellence long term growth companies that are Uh, embracing cutting edge technologies smart policies the right commercial behavior which is extremely important to the topic that we're talking about and you know, such organization can you know through resilience and agility create a lot of differentiated cap capabilities and uh, you know uh, competitive advantages for themselves in the market if you look at it from the governance body perspective and coming to your focused questions vishaki uh, what does the board and the audit committee expect 
you know, from the CXOs. You know, let's let's look at CXOs because CFOs and CEOs are pretty much handholders for each other in business, you know, growth, business strategy, business vision, etc. Uh, you know, the board, the governance bodies would look at the CXOs. You know, from uh, let's say from uh, you know four perspectives. You know, uh, they expect them to be strategists and catalysts where they're supposed to define the vision and the objective of the organization and also be you know uh, the front runners in ensuring that the organization embraces you know uh, uh, the, the the policies the technology the strategy the you know go forward uh, steps that are required to actually meet those objectives now how does that get uh, you know delivered it's extremely important for you know the cfo and the ceo to clearly understand that, you know, what is it that they are trying to uh, build in terms of vision of the organization. If you look at it from a business growth perspective, I think, you know, the credit, uh, you know, risk and its coverage through, you know, ensuring proper uh, commercial uh, practices like taking credit insurance, uh, you know, becomes extremely important. You know, a uh, couple of things that, that the governance body expects, you know, the CXOs to safeguard is that the capital should be protected. The cash flow are you know kind of well maintained. There is a proper uh, loan servicing and repayments are enhanced. The earnings are secured. You know all these things collectively allow the company to you know feel secure in exploring new market and extending credits to customers, which enhances business in turn. You know approaching new new geographies, uh, being more you know business focused rather than running constantly in the risk of running credit risk and and losing business. Uh, export boundaries, you know, exploring. Uh, uh, so therefore, it's very important for these CXOs, you know, to to stand up to the expectations of the governance bodies to be uh, playing the role of a strategist uh, as well as a catalyst. Having said that, it's also important to look at the other roles where the boards or the audit committees also expect the CFO and the CEO to play the role of, you know, uh, a very diligent operator and a steward. You know, I'm, I'm actually drawing reference from uh, a study of Deloitte in terms of you know expectations of the governance bodies from CFOs and CEOs. Uh, you know, while they are expected to define and design the strategy, they're also expected to make sure that you know there is a proper system, a process, a proper, a proper well-defined method to the madness. Uh, commercial insurance, credit uh, insurance, while it's a, it's an excellent, amazing solution. For companies that really want to go fast and you know cross boundaries but it cannot be taken as a substitute for a prudent and a thoughtful credit management it's extremely important that you know as stewards and as operators of the organization the cxos think about the sound credit management practices that they will have to make as foundation for businesses to kind of you know operate as you know uh, from a ring fencing the risk perspective uh, the credit insurance can go beyond indemnification and doesn't replace the company's processes like, you know, do we do a proper uh, customer risk profiling? Do we have a very strong monitoring of uh, the receivables? Do we rely on technology to monitor, you know, all the receivables as the business grows? You can always rely on manual processes. Uh, even before onboarding customers, do we have a very strong digital screening process? You know, could be including social media because, you know, a lot of news is there in the public domain that gives any company very good insight, uh, especially, you know, any emerging risk for a customer, you know, that uh, if identified early can actually save a lot of resources for the organization, very well-defined, well-implemented credit policies, uh, etc. So therefore, you know, in summary, uh, the governance bodies, you know, have a lot of expectations and also a lot of guidance you know that is clearly called out for the cxos to make sure that you know while business expansion remains focused they don't miss out on mitigating this risk while also in a very balanced way embracing new solutions like uh, credit insurance so that business can manage its risk and not lose sight of the kind of growth any business, uh, you know, would love to have. Thank you so much, Mr. Yogesh Mittal for wonderful insight. I would just like to add here that managing credit 
exposure is very important and very critical for even board members from the corporate governance point of view otherwise it can lead to personal liability on such you know key managerial person and it can lead to directors and officers liability claim as well so uh, in in a way it is important or uh, you know imperative to have properly drafted trade credit insurance policy along with a robust directors and officers liability policy in place which we specialize into and also to talk about cyber attack or any fraudulent cases so we came across one such case study or one such uh, live case where uh, you know one of the buyers they had made payment but at their end there was a cyber attack because of which the seller here our our client did not receive any money and when they started chasing the buyer the buyer was like mm. i had made payment once but then it did not reach you because of a cyber attack then what am i supposed to do so these are some of the live cases which we see and which we experience and that is where uh, you know a company as a whole need to reinforce all the exposures from all the perspectives including trade credit so thank you so much mr yogesh mithil now uh, we will uh, move on to our another uh, speaker mr jagdish bahiti so uh, mr jagdish the question for you is due to recession in some of the advanced countries do you foresee upward trend in bed debts and if yes like you know what would be the solution that a corporate should have in place to address this issue thanks for that there is definitely a lot of uh, trade depends upon how some of the developed countries are doing if there is recession in uh, countries like say us it will impact trade in a lot of many countries and would definitely increase trend in bad debts in india as well as we export a lot of goods and services to us and lot of trade depends upon it the impact would directly be a result of the magnitude of the recession it can minimize india's exports due to its heavy trade with the us last year we exported around usd 71.5 billion worth of goods and services so making it the largest export market for india and if the exporters lose businesses they will definitely not able to make payments to their suppliers and ultimately bad debts will increase the us market contributes anywhere say 40 to 80% of the revenues earned by the it companies TCLs, Infosys, Wipro, HCL, and Tech Mahindra uh, are the top five firms having more than 50% exposure to it. And if we look from the other other side, if there is recession in exporting countries, uh, they may in uh, intentionally reduce value of their currency so that import will be cheaper for these countries in which they are exporting, and their revenues will increase. Uh, for example, China did it many times; they depreciated yuan's value. against usd so that exports will be cheaper and they will generate more revenues out of it so definitely if there is recession in some of the developed countries it will impact lot many countries uh, that's it vaisakhi yeah sure thank you thank you mr jagdish so again the uh, same uh, you know issue that how do you address this risk and it's not that corporates are not going to or stop going to function the way they are functioning right because you never know which country is going to be under uh, you know through recession or not so it is very dynamic world volatile world and it is very uh, you know difficult to even shortlist a buyer from a particular country just bases the past record of that particular buyer because you never know what the country as a whole is going through so that is why uh, to ring fence this exposure and to see to it that our cash flow is not hampered by any way or our profit margins are, margins are not hampered in any way trade credit insurance is something which is to be looked at looked at yeah so thank you mr jagdish now we will move on to our another speaker mr rajneesh magan so uh, uh, rajneesh i just wanted to know with the companies assess financial stability of buyer and like is there any mechanism for the companies to do that and whether the companies have uh, you know an upper hand as a seller like when i am going to uh, get into a contract with particular buyer 
can I, you know, insist on uh, having a assessment of their financial stability? Sure, Vishakhi. I mean, uh, good question. I, Vishakhi, I, I can say from, uh, of course, not the entire industry perspective, from the industry we operate like the manufacturing and the EPC. Mostly, uh, I would say the companies do uh, the uh, assessment of the financial stability of the buyers, but it all depends on the risk framework and how much of the risk profiling you want to do for your customers. Uh, further, you, I mean, get into the classification, whether you are your existing customers or these are your new customer. For the existing customers, the buyer would definitely have, a, a seller would definitely have a comfort of selling for a long time. There is the relationship in place. You have the comfort unless something drastically has gone wrong with the buyers or they are become financially unstable or a sick company or you know they are uh, red flag raised uh, due to other reasons then of course you can uh, check again uh, from the uh, risk, do the risk profiling of the company but for the new customers especially in our organization we have been doing the risk profiling before you know bringing the customers on board uh, it's very important because we have a lot, a lot of exposure in terms of the projects we do is a high magnitude projects and which you know span over a period of sometime 12 months sometimes goes up to 24 to 30 months depending on the project cycle of the project you are in different phases of the project from engineering to the supply to the commissioning installation so it is very important that you do the risk profiling of the customer at least at the time the onboarding of the customer is done you are at least sure the customer is financially strong and financially viable customer. Things can go wrong over a period of time that of course reassessments can be done again. And there are many agencies in the market to help you and support you in this, like companies like Dun & Bradstreet and Criff are there, which do the risk profiling of the companies and give you a risk report, or also let you know how much of exposure would you, you can do with these companies based on your business. So there are methods of doing it, but it again depends on the risk framework generally followed we are aggressive company or you're a conservative company what kind of risk philosophy you have so it's a mix of all i would say so i would like to invite views of mr jagdish as well here uh, actually we are not able to hear you mr jagdish so uh, yes, definitely in today's context, before starting business with anybody, a buyer or a vendor, we should know financial stability of their business. If they are not financially stable, there could be problems in our business later on. If it's a vendor, we should get the required supplies. And if we are giving credit to the buyer, they should be so stable that there will not be problems in the payments. And as Mr. Rajneesh explained, to assess financial stability, we can obtain a copy of their financial statements with the auditor's opinion letter of the buyer, including those of its parent company. We can analyze key figures and ratios which are important to determine financial stability, like revenues, profits, cash flow, current and liquid ratios, and the net worth. Uh, depending, depending upon all these, we can decide the credit period and whether to go for trade insurance or not. That also we can plan. And there is a lot of information in public domain as well. If the customer has made any default, maybe in repayment of loan or not filing and paying government dues, we can refer to GST information also, whether the customer complies all the rules of GST or has defaulted any, that is also very important. And if it's in case of exports, if we don't get uh, public information, if we don't get uh, information on any public domains, we can take help of credit rating agencies and other service providers. Service providers like Dun & Bradstreet is very popular. We can ask for Dun's number to get all the information. Uh, so I'll say to mitigate the risk in business, it's very important to assess financial stability of the buyer. And based on that, we can fix credit terms. Sure. 
Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Rajneesh and Jagdish, for uh, such a wonderful insight. So, so what I understand here that you know it should also form a part of risk mitigation provisions internally for some of the companies where they have lot of open credit terms business, where you know they need to check this financial stability of the buyers as well before entering into the contract. So, thank you so much, uh, you know, for this. Uh, insight now i will move on to another question for mr rahul kedia here that uh, there are some some of the sanctioned countries and we see that again this is a very dynamic world some of the countries which were not appearing under sanction are now considered as sanctioned countries so uh, the kind of business risk that emanates from such sanctions being imposed on some of the countries across the globe what is your uh, you know take on that uh thanks thanks vesaki for uh, this question this is very much relevant uh, in current days uh, so first is that why we hear of sanctions so this came to the news broadly this year where the never ending war between uh, russia and ukraine started and it's still going on and a couple of rounds of sanctions been there but uh, why countries impose sanction on others or something like that so the the key reasons which i find is that even it could be a form of cyber attacks which i think yogesh was also trying to touch upon and then also like uh, invasion to other territories which we are seeing in the current world so in those cases we see uh, sanctions coming sanctions are multifold it could be in different ways we have even seen that india taking some stringent route against uh, the digital apps or something for china but in the uh, uh, more uh, simple form if i look upon the sanction which hurts the economy is like on the uh, trade routes and the caesar part on the sx and other things and blocking those market to operate so <clears throat> here the impact of sanction is uh, much much bigger it in general people believe or we find that okay sanctions can only impact the markets on whom the sanctions are being imposed but uh, this year is a classic year where we can see that sanction has been imposed on uh, russia broadly by all the developed markets and expected uh, from all the other markets also to join for the sanction but actually does only russia is suffering answer is no the entire world is suffering because just not because of uh, the what is imposed in russia it is also impacting because a lot of supplies which russia was used to do to rest of the world be it uh, most common is the natural gas natural gas is the biggest uh, supply from russia to even to europe and to many other markets and that is what is impacting and because of this also the there is a direct impact and there is an indirect impact so direct impact we can see uh, immediately coming into the business which is increasing in the cost of products the sourcing cost is going up because we, now we have to look out for alternates take another example semiconductors we find that suddenly the relevance of semiconductor has gone up broadly in all the market beat mobile phones or even in medical devices we find that uh, many markets even including us we find some stress level uh, testing because these were not chips were not available in the market and because of which we can't cater to our market in india or be it any other part so that is there and also uh, because of other supplies the inflation has sort up we are finding inflation even in the developed markets that it is on 40 years high or something like that india is also on high but as compared to those we are still self sustained i don't say that this is a good sign but yes inflation is going up which is impact uh, impacting the consumers buying so consumers buying pattern had changed after this and i'm finding that uh, i find that a lot of people are deferring those purchasing decisions which they are not really need because of the r so there are two two ways to look upon sanctions definitely impacts those market but in a broader perspective overall world we are suffering because of this and uh, both directly and indirectly so my customers are getting impacted because of higher cost inflation uh, distribution cost fuel cost has gone up and the critical supplies are getting impacted and we are not ready uh, as a market also and as many countries are not ready to immediately replace the sourcing from one market to another so we are heavily dependent there so uh, 
it's also opportunity for fresh investments which many countries are doing it many countries are doing it and uh, that's where the opportunity lies there so mixed bag but overall i would say some opportunity but more pain to start with back to you thank you thank you so much mr kedia for uh, this uh, you know interesting discussion so uh, in continuation of this discussion i will move on, move on to mr yogesh mittal again uh, we have discussed about recession sanction being imposed and social media you know the information available in public domain so uh, uh, mr yogesh the question is whether you feel a need of enhancing you know customer risk profiling closer monitoring of outstanding or technology driven processes for receivable monitoring digital screening in social media so do you foresee that the need is going up or this is the time that you know the company should invest heavily in this uh, aspect absolutely we shot a very valid question uh, if you look at all the uh challenges that the industry is facing today a lot of them are linked to you know uncontrollably uh, uncontrollable risks specifically risks that emanate from macroeconomic scenarios we spoke about sanctions you know being applied on a uh, different uh, part of the world you know because of their decisions uh today's environment as business grows as each corporate grows there is a very critical need for the organizations systems and processes to be very robust as i mentioned earlier to start with uh, it is a very baseline expectation for the organizational policies approach to be very clearly defined and very well documented for example if you look at uh, you know the specific aspect that we have focused on that's the credit risk uh, you know the whole process of exploring the new market uh, onboarding new customers there has to be a very strong process and policies documented around what are the kind of risks that need to be mitigated what are the kind of uh, you know uh, screening the background checks the commercial capabilities etc that need to be validated credit agencies play a very active role here the company needs to have a very well established process around that uh, secondly as these processes are implemented and the customers are onboarded i think onboarding a customer should not be the end of the process there has to be a very strong process of constantly monitoring uh, the credit health of the customers you know there should be frequent uh, you know gate checks of uh, seeking the financial uh, statements the credit ratings of the uh, customers especially in the international geography because domestic market is a little easier to monitor as compared to international market although the rigor should be the same i think all these checks should uh, you know lead to a internal definition what is the associated risk and what are the kind of credit limits that an organization should uh extend to different categories of customers they can be buckets and all this should be actually hosted through very strong technologies today erps a lot of erp almost every erp offers crm solutions where all these features are very uh, easily accessible and integrated uh, integration is possible to you know different sales tools that are being used if you look at from a regulator's perspective you know over a period of time almost every regulator has come up with expectation of companies internal controls to be very robustly defined and you know in many instances also uh, reviewed or audited by external agencies for example uh, you know post satyam sarbanes oxley act was implemented which uh, you know not only talks about financial reporting controls it also talks about you know uh, the different processes around uh, you know key components of business you know on the cost side of the revenue side uh, companies to have very robust controls to make sure that the transactions are valid the balances are authenticated the assets and liabilities of the company are fairly stated and any emerging risk gets identified on a timely basis india uh, indian regulator has uh, also embraced that in form of uh, ifc internal financial controls reporting uh very similar to the international standards so all these things 
uh, bring out a very critical requirement for every organization to have a very strong and robust process around mitigating all risks that are critical for an organization, more focused on the credit risk, uh, you know, because a monetary loss is, uh, is, is something that can have severe implications, even on the going concern, you know, assumption of, uh, you know, organization level of technology can vary depending upon scale and size of an organization uh, not every organization you know uh, would be able to invest in similar kind of technology but then it is highly recommended and uh, you know every governance function as i said earlier and every cxo is focused on making sure that there is a heavy reliance on technology uh, not just to mitigate the risk to make sure that the organization is resilient and agile and you know, as far as possible, ring fence from controllable risks, and also prepare to be able to manage uncontrollable risks in a fairly efficient uh, manner. I hope that answers your question, Vishakhi. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. So again, it all boils down to the risk management philosophy of an organization. How well they are defining this philosophy internally, how well they are able to manage this risk as well. So we had one such client for uh, one of the trade credit policies where even with the, uh, they were having a cover in place, credit insurance policy in place, but they were so particular about their, you know, outstanding dues that they had an internal mechanism. They had, uh, you know, a department to monitor each and every buyer their dues and what is the timeline they've taken post the uh, payment is overdue uh, in what timeline they are able to make the payment and basis that the management used to take you know decision whether they should continue with that particular buyer or not so ultimately the insurance company it is the obligation of both insurance company and the insured organization as well to mitigate the risk and control the outstanding otherwise uh, there are certain, uh, you know, uh, sectors which are highly unorganized where the insurance companies are not even, you know, willing to support or willing to offer competitive, competitive rates or they are just, you know, shying away from uh, offering covers to them. So it is the joint responsibility of insured organization and insurance company as well. So uh, thank you very much. I am moving over to the last question of our uh, discussion today. So my question is on letter of credit to Mr. Jagdish Bahati and also Mr. Rajneesh Magan. What are the challenges which are faced by companies in selling goods on letter of credit? Because it's a historical, uh, you know, way of uh, dealing with the customers. So what are the challenges now in, you know, recent times? Thanks, Vajati. Uh, I'll say rate of credit being widely used to mitigate the risk in international trade. There are no letter of credit. The first risk I think uh, can be mentioned the general risk group with the country, country risk or political risk. Since international trade involves factors that take place outside uh, inter importer and exporters control, this can be quite a risk affecting letters of credit. These factors include a change in the trade regime, civil war, mass reward, transfer risk, currency control system, and sovereign risk, to name a few. Uh, let me give one example. Our customer, which is from France, opened the LC in favor of us. We have checked the letter of credit conditions and they seem workable. Then we have produced and saved the order as per LC and transmitted the required documents to the issuing bank before the expiry date. The issuing bank also found our presentation complying and informed us that they will be honoring our payment came at the maturity date. However, before the maturity date due, uh, France has changed its export regime, which makes it impossible for the issuing bank to honor our presentation. So uh, it's very risky for letter of credit and uh, the situation changed completely once there was change in the regulations made by France. Uh, besides restrictions that occur due to geographical differences, international trade also consists of fraud risk. In comparison with international trade, domestic trade have less risk. Uh, further business 
processes that involve a bigger transaction also tend to cause a tensor in terms of com companies that losses quickly. Uh, let's not forget that fraud fraudulent companies disappear before one can reach them legally. So this is the second risk I'll say. Uh, with this, I'll pass it on to you. Sure. Mr. Rajneesh, your views, please. Yeah. So my take on this is, I mean, uh, once a buyer and seller enter into any kind of arrangement or an agreement to contract, and usually the LCs I've seen mostly happen in the overseas business. We have been doing LC with the overseas business with the domestic customer. Usually it's never through, mostly never through LC because you have a past experience of the credit behavior. So all these credit ratings are judged. But uh, overseas, yes, payments are through LC. And if the, all the documentation part is clear per se, LC is not a risk, but now considering the kind of situation we have in the recent times, especially the force major events which have arisen due to, you know, the some earlier due to COVID and not due to Ukraine war or due to other thing where, where the, let's say an example where the, the seller were to sell her goods and the buyer were to pay on FOR destination, not the X works uh, and the documents were to be exchanged and the ship is stuck somewhere on the high seas and goods cannot be delivered because of the war like situation in Ukraine or what's happening now in uh, perhaps Taiwan, then you're in difficult trouble. You have, your goods are out of your shores in the country and uh, already on the high seas and you're not getting paid because the customer has not received the goods at the port, port of arrival. So there are situations like this. For this, of course, there are trade credit insurances in place. Uh, uh, which you can cover your part of the risk. But yes, uh, some of the unforeseen events are happening, which makes the life a little difficult for uh, the sellers. The other part, what we have seen in the business, we are in, especially, uh, we have a LC for the projects, which are uh, where the usage period of the LC is a little higher. It's not only the product supply, because the customer expects you to, you know, commission the product also and hand over the entire project to them. So once that happens and the, and the LC usage period goes from 180 days beyond, and we would want to discount those LCs through our bankers in India. The problem what we have faced generally is from the LCs getting issued from the Islamic banks in a country which are Islamic countries or especially the African countries. And which where the LC issuing banks are not the first class banks or the international banks then getting those LCs discounting in India is a bit difficult task because the bank goes on for the assessment of the LC issuing bank and all this credit profiling is done at a later date, provided you want to discount LC. So all those risks emerging from the LCs are there, but uh, there are definitely the mechanisms also in place with respect to the trade insurance, which one can definitely opt for and insulate uh, the business from the you know emerging risk. Thank you so much. I'm really thankful and grateful to have such honored speakers with us. So now we can move on to, uh, you know, question answer session. Thank you, Vaishraki. Uh, I've presented the question on stage for everybody to see. Uh, request uh, any of the panelists to pick this would like to know whether the past outstanding is being covered if so, sure. to an extent. Sure. So, uh, yes, past outstanding when we talk about if the, uh, let's say, organization is going on for the policy for the first time and there are certain dues which are outstanding. Now, when you are going in for the policy for the first time and when you insert the policy, obviously in India it is cash before cover, so you will have to make payment of premium. Let's say you are purchasing the policy and the start date of the policy is 1st April 2022. On that particular day, if a company is already bankrupt, who is one of your buyers, then it might be difficult to cover. Also, there would be certain number of days limitations given to each of the buyers or maybe as a whole to the organization which is purchasing the policy, let's say a certain number of days, maybe 30 days passed overdue or 60 days passed overdue, certain such kind of risk cannot be covered. So there are ways and means to address and each of the companies would, would have different philosophy to address outstanding dues as on date for the uh, organization going in for purchasing the policy for the first time. Uh, 
I hope it answers the question. Yes, Vishakhi, thank you. I've got one more. Okay. So when we compare other options available in the market, how can we differentiate when it comes to cost? So as we discussed earlier also, the cost that is the premium is a derivative of so many factors affecting the you know exposure. So it will be first of all the turnover, whether we wish to cover the whole turnover or specific turnover, whether we wish to cover the you know entire gamut of risk or we are only planning to cover a particular section of the risk that is a particular geography or a particular product but when you look around the options available in the market what we need to compare apart from the premium what are the you know conditions which are being imposed by various insurance companies what are the subjectivities what are the methodology they use to you know help you or assist you in determining whether this buyer is fit uh, to do transaction or not because some of the uh, traditional companies will not have those technical uh, you know technology based advancement or technology based tools to help you or assist you to determining the limit or to determining whether you should continue transacting with that buyer also you know how the companies are coming up in indemnification so uh, up till uh, now there was the total indemnity available under the trade credit policy was 85% but now IRDA has opened up the door and they have allowed the companies to indemnify up to 90% for some of the segments they have also allowed to indemnify up to 95%. So apart from cost, there will be so many other factors, so many other added advantages which some of the companies would be able to offer, which some of the traditional companies would not be able to offer cover for or you know uh, they will not have even that much bandwidth to assist you at the time of claim so we have seen some of the traditional companies insurance companies where the uh, you know uh, insured organization is struggling to get the claim paid not because of anything else but because you know the sole responsibility falls back on insured organization that you should have done due diligence before appointing or before getting into a contract with a particular buyer not only that uh, you know periodically you should have reviewed their credit limit you should have reviewed their behavior you should have reviewed their you know uh, credit paying ability and all so there are so many factors which are affecting nowadays apart from cost and as a broker we for sure know that which are those companies backed by some of the largest reinsurance companies who can you know literally help us at the time of claim because at the time of claim we need hand holding from the insurance company rather than you know having a dispute that it is your obligation it is not our obligation So uh, we can move on to next question, Shantanu. Okay. So I believe somebody spoke about uh, the credit rating. So please enlighten uh, the question as it appears on your screen. So I think the Dunn's number is specific to what has been issued by Dunn and Bradstreet. This is Dunn and Bradstreet which issues the Dunn's number. If, if the company is registered with Dunn's, uh, they get uh, done and bear sheet. They give you a dust number with that. You can check the entire credit history of the company. But uh, if you want to check, you also need to be registered with done and bear sheet. Let me check the number. We get all the history of the company. So nowadays it's very popular. I, I believe this one could open the Pandora's box. Uh, 
what is the claim settlement ratio? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, it is uh, not like, you know, that uh, it will be a straight answer for everybody. So, claim settlement ratio, again, depends on so many factors as we discussed. So, one, the risk management philosophy, which the organization is, you know, following internally lot more depend and not only in trade credit insurance you look around any general insurance policy the onus is equally on the insured organization so at times we have seen that you know the organizations they transact on letter of credit heavily and then they are uh, stuck with that particular you know debt now in such circumstances the insurance company will definitely uh, you know put up a question maybe at the time of accepting the risk or before accepting the risk or also at the time of claim that you know how are you transacting in such large volumes on letter of credit because it's a traditional way of transacting but apart from that apart from such, uh, some of the hindrances we have seen that claim settlement ratio is quite good in trade credit space because first the moment there is a default uh, or delaying payment, we need to reach out to the insurance company. If it is the buyer who is insolvent, the payment gets uh, done by the insurance company in maximum one month's time. So that is the added advantage of having a trade credit insurance policy because the moment buyer is insolvent, we do not have to do anything else. We just need to inform the insurance company and the insurance company will make good the loss within a week, month's time. But when there is a protracted default, that is delaying payment, then obviously we also need to have checks and balances internally. We need to, uh, you know, set, uh, set up a reminder for each of these buyers who are delaying in payment and what is the methodology we have, what are the processes we have in place, whether it is the same buyer who is repetitively, you know, delaying the payment. If that is the case, then definitely the insurance company will question us that why you want to still transact with that. Because when we know there is an exposure, known exposure, and insurance is all about, you know, unknown exposures and, uh, you know, some of the things which may come out even if you have proper SOPs in place. Otherwise, claim settlement ratio is very good world over. The insurance companies are always there to support the insured organization because this is the most vulnerable area and this is the most dynamic, I would say, uh, area where insurance company also cannot take a chance by not paying payment. But there will be certain set of documentation which will be required, certain set of, you know, evidences which will be required. And the organization, insured organization will also have to cooperate with the insurance company. I hope this answers the question. Yes, okay. thank you so much. I don't see any more questions. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Mahindra Insurance Brokers Limited. Beshaki, thank you so much for your time uh, to present uh, building resilience through trade credit insurance, a topic which is uh, very relevant and something which we need to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, thank you, all speakers. I look forward to seeing some of you in Bombay uh, on the 16th of September. Uh, thank you, Jagdish. Thank you, Rajneesh, sir, Rahul, and Yogesh. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, thank you thank all you the participants. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you so Thank much. You, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye.